when you read a book, when you play a video game, when you watch a very interesting television program, you are immersed in the media. You dive into it. You're not really in the physical space anymore. You are in something different, which is exciting and which we like a lot. However, today I would like to talk about something slightly different, which I call real-scale media. The big difference between immersive media and real-scale media is that immersive media are media content we dive into, whether real-scale media is media content we live with. Most of the existing media are media content of the, first type, of the first type because we don't have basically the right media player for the second kind of media that I want to talk about today. So the first thing I have to do is actually introducing you to a new machine, a new computer, a new media player, which is capable of creating experiments, creating storytelling, creating games that have a different type of relationship with their user. This system is called QB1, and as you can see, it is slightly like a robotic display, a motorized display. You have a fabric skin, and underneath that fabric, fabric skin, you have silent motors. On the head, you have two microphones, one on the left, one on the right, a bit like your, a human head. And you have, if you look closer, um, some small dots around a screen. These are small LEDs, small lights, that do infrared illumination in a pulse manner. And you have a camera, a special camera. And these two systems permit not only to see what's happening in front of the device, but also to see the depth. Basically, you have the X and Y, but also the Z coordinate of what's happening in the, in, in the scene. Basically, it looks a bit uh, like this. It can basically reconstruct an image, which is a 3D image, of its surrounding. It can also be used to do face tracking, to do um, face identification, recognizing who the user is and also to do uh, visual tags and object recognition. Basically, if you show a particular object to it, it may act differently, it may start an application, for instance, it may launch a music. We'll see some examples. The thing which is important to understand is that, and which is something I'm going to tell again and again in this talk, QB1 is here with us. QB1 basically lives in the same physical space as we do. And probably um, the best way to recognize that is to have a look at it. You see, I mean, basically, it will use what it perceives, the sound, the image, to react to its surrounding. Here it sees my face, but imagine like I'm slightly uh, different, like a, like a child. It will potentially adapt to me and change its position. I can call it from another side, QB1, QB1, <laughs> and it's actually changing its position. It's in the same space as I am. Now, of course, the first thing if you have real scale media is that you have, need to have real scale application. So I'm going to start an application simply by uh, showing an object to it. And I can sli still basically move while this application is running, and the interface adapts to me. And then at a distance, I will be able, actually, to uh, interact without a mouse, without a glove, simply by uh, remotely using gestures in front of the system. Here I just started a song. Maybe slightly louder. Oh, that's too loud. I can maybe pick another one. 
So I have a feeling. I can also browse my entire library simply but like this, you see? Very fast. I'm just picking an imaginary slider, which is not on the screen, but here. And then select by touching an imaginary button, which is here, and which is always here, which is, which is the important point, and start a song. Or another one. Let me explain to you how the system works in slightly more detail. What the system perceives for this type of real-scale interactivity, first, it's a face. But when you have a face, usually there's a body attached to it. <laughs> so it basically finds this point here, and we've been studying for long months how people were gesturing and how we could model that. Basically, your gestures are organized in the form of concentric circle around that point here, like this. And if you want to use a screen to interact, then you have to create a form of halo of interactivity around that center point. This is precisely what the system is doing. It finds the user, zoom at the right level, and then create that halo of interactivity. But then you must design a particular type of user interface for that. And that's difficult because, you know, it's not like a touch screen that you can actually touch. It's not like a mouse where it's very clear. It's something which is like not tangible in some way. So we've been inventing a new language for that. And one of the first attempts we made was to define two types of zones. <coughs> there's the blue zones, the cold zones, and there's the hot zones. When you talk, when I'm giving a talk like this one, I'm gesturing very often like this, you see? And that means that if I would have a system that would react to any small gesture like this, it will be like hell, basically. I would just do this and start a song and then do it. Okay. But correct me if I'm wrong, since the beginning of that talk, I, di of that talk, I didn't do like this. <laughs> so that zone there, the hot zone, you can decide to have like buttons which are very sensitive. Like if I want to start a song, I just do this and it starts. Whereas if I want to use that part here, I will have to have gesture which has much more long, repetitive things you may not do by mistake. And this is precisely what you've seen in the demonstration I've just showed. Long gesture like this to slide between your <coughs> movie content or your music content and very interactive gesture, very rapid gesture over the head. This is just the beginning. Basically, you have to reinvent all the language of the mouse, of the graphical user interface, for that new media. Here, the ex example I just showed was browsing into media files. But of course, you may invent many others. And I will show you a couple of other ones. Some of you may, when I see that device, think, oh, I seen that somewhere else already. I mean, actually, Microsoft is doing something great. And they show very impressive demonstration where they use 3D cameras to actually play games uh, in a very new interactive manner. So that's absolutely true. Still, and that's a very important point that you must understand, that technology is not necessarily the key point in that thing. It's more like a philosophical approach in how to want and the type of experiment you want to create with the user. In that particular case, you have a, a player that, which is actually using its whole body to interact with a game. That means the system is sensing its whole body. It can actually detect its position, its posture, and then it plays a character in the game which is uh, representing all these new uh, data that the system is capturing. Yet, this is for me still an immersive system. There's no joystick, there's no controller, but still that person there it's not in the physical space. She's actually in the television. And that's great. And there's many games that can be done that way. What we try to do with that device is slightly different. We try to come up with situation where actually you would experience a game or a story, 
not being in the screen, but being in the physical world. Uh, maybe for this I would need a volunteer. Uh, ca can you come on, on, on stage? <laughs> What's your name? Hi, I'm Stefano. Okay, B big applause for Stefano. I mean, <laughs> okay, you'll see it's not very, very difficult. It's a tennis game, which basically is played like a normal tennis. I will just show the system that I'm here, and just put your head on the on the red part. Okay, here we go. There's a ball. Oops. Oh, okay. I should have practiced slightly more. <laughs> that was easy. Okay, let's let's do it again. Okay, I got it from here. You can use your whole body to interact. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, Oop. okay. Oh, I, I think I, I picked the right person here. <laughs> but I mean, I have some special tricks like this. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, Oop. Oh, maybe actually I grabbed a new racket, which is better like this. And, okay. Oh. Very good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. Do you see the point I wanted to make? Uh, in that case, although there's clear, still your screen, but on that screen there's not some fancy graphic or anything. There's the real world plus a ball, and we have to coordinate ourselves to see, okay, we're there physically, we're almost one in front of another, but there's that ball that we look a bit on the side, and we're playing in an imaginary world which just mixed with the real one. And that's what I call real scale media. There's something else. If you have device like that, they share a space with you. As they live with the same in the same space, they have a form of intimacy that no other media can have. Let me give you just an example, but this, this is one over many. Um, if I'm using the music system I just showed before, the system can, of course, know which music I'm playing at which moment. It can know that I'm playing the Beatles uh, just to wake me up, but it knows also who is there when I'm playing the music. And as you know, this is very important. You don't play the same music when you're alone or when you have guests, or when you want a romantic evening, or when you want to just be uh, waking up in the morning. And this is very complex, probably very difficult to model, actually. Still, that system can perceive much more than a traditional system. It can perceive which record you play and who are the person in the room when you play them. This means that typically, um, imagine that for a couple of evenings, uh, I've been playing some uh, jazz music or classical music, and it recognized that there is me, my wife, and some unknown friends, but there are two persons there. This defines the context. Maybe for the next uh, evening, it will actually uh, found back a context which is very similar, which is, oh, there's you, your wife, and two, again, different per persons, but still this defines more or less a, a form of social context, which maybe. Uh, is appropriate for a music that the system will choose. This is one example over many. The fact that when you have not immersive content, but content which is at real scale, which is mixed with the real world, then you end up, of course, having some form of interaction and relationships with the media, which is slightly different. Um, let me just uh, wrap up. Real scale media will not kill, of course, immersive media. But real-scale media opened really exciting new avenue to explore, and I've just been showing a couple of them. So basically, uh, if you want to join us in this adventure, don't hesitate. Uh, we're actually uh, offering now a software development kits for labs in the world that want to build new application for the, this type of computers. Uh, we can't do that all by ourselves, that's absolutely clear. So don't hesitate to contact me if you want to be part of that adventure, and I thank you all. <laughs>